Thank you for joining me on another episode of She Leads Now podcast, where we help career and entrepreneurial women gain the tools to develop a success mindset, create winning strategies, build collaborative relationships, and take bold action towards creating impact and fulfillment in their lives and careers. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I'm on a mission to awaken and activate women and emerging leaders so they can tap into their innate leadership ability, elevate their influence, and create the impact they were destined to make. If you're ready to up-level your confidence, courage, and influence, you've come to the right place. Join me weekly for insights, strategies, and resources to help you grow, develop, and embody the leader you were meant to be so that you can make the impact you know you are called to make and establish the legacy you've always dreamed. The world eagerly awaits the emergence of your brilliance, impact, and influence. So with that, let's dive into this week's episode. Joining me today on the She Leads Now podcast is Katha Blackwell. Katha is the CEO of Partnership Against Domestic Violence. She is also the author of Not Another Victim, A Woman's Guide to Avoiding a Bad Relationship, which was released in 2011. She has been in the field of social work for over 20 years. And today I'm excited to have her on as she shares her journey in climbing up to the C-suite, as well as the amazing work that she's been doing to support victims of domestic violence and women. So with that, welcome to the show, Katha. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes, we're excited to have you. So before we get into the work that you do, I would love for you to share a little bit about your journey and how you came into this. Uh, You have such an amazing testimony and how you came into this space. And I'd love for you to share that with the audience. Absolutely. So probably about um, two years ago, I was attending a church event that focused in on knowing your purpose. It's called Thirst. It's a thirst event in my church. And for some reason, the person who was up at the podium who was speaking as they were praying and worshiping and everything, he made he said something along the lines of some of you all are CEOs in the making and you need to receive it. And I knew, I knew God was talking to me. I knew I was one of those people because I had been going back and forth with whether or not I ever even wanted to be a CEO. I was very content with the role I was in. I was walking in my purpose, doing what God had called me to do. And two years forward, our CEO had put in her resignation saying that she's going to be retiring in a year. And so in January of 2021, she had announced that she was retiring And I thought to myself, because of the way our policies and procedures were set up, I thought that there's no way I could be the CEO of this agency. I'd have to leave and come back in order for this to happen. But then she had shared with us, the board has considered, has decided to look within as it relates to the next CEO. They're they're open to looking within the agency because they believe we have strong leadership and they are going to keep that option open as well. So I was like, oh, okay, that's amazing. (laughs) That's good to hear. And God just started working with me. And I started every morning, I started confessing, I'm the next CEO of PADV. I'm the next CEO of Partnership Against Domestic Violence. And I started confessing that at times where I didn't really feel like, may not have believed it for myself, but I know that our words have power. And so I started confessing that. And I could see myself having a different walk and having a different mindset about myself, not shying away from opportunities to engage in conversation with people I don't know, but really realizing that God has a unique role for me in this space. And I need to own that in this time. I always tell people there's somebody who's waiting on you to show up. They're waiting on your gifts. They're waiting on your talents to be present in that space. And so stop putting yourself down, stop pushing yourself to the side and just embrace it. And Along the way, as once the opportunity came, probably in like September for me to actually apply to be the CEO of PADV, I started studying as much as I possibly could about interviews and panel interviews because it was supposed to be like seven, <laughs> a seven panel interview on a Saturday morning for two hours. And I started preparing myself, even with that whole process, while I was waiting to hear about this CEO position, I had another opportunity to go in a different direction as a um, COO, I decided that I was going to let go of the COO opportunity and just stand in faith with the CEO position, not knowing whether or not they were going to select me, not knowing what would happen next. But 
I decided that I'm going to stand in faith. If I'm confessing this, my actions need to line up with my faith. If I'm confessing that I'm the next CEO, then my actions need to line up with that. There's no backup plans. I'm standing in faith. This is what's going to happen. And while I was praying to God about that, he said, Katha, it's going to be good. And so not knowing which direction things were going to go, none of those things, I realized that when God says something is going to be good, it's going to be good. He knows all the details. He knows what the outcome is going to be. And I just received that. And I was like, I'm just going to stand in faith for this position, knowing that even if I get turned down for this role, God still said it's going to be good. So there must be something else on the other side that's still good. And so long story short, I was offered the CEO position and I have just completely enjoyed and been so grateful for this opportunity. It's been an amazing journey. And so that's the story in a nutshell as it relates to the CEO position. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for, for walking us through that process. You're absolutely right. Whenever we're moving into the next best version of ourselves or that next level, there is a lot of fear that comes with it. There is a lot of doubt. There is a lot of insecurity, like Mm -hmm. all of our worry, like comes (laughs) to the surface. And it's a matter of learning how to work through some of that identifying, okay, well, what's coming up for me? How do I push past it? And and for you, it sounds Mm -hmm. like your faith is, is a huge element in terms of helping you to move through that. So thank you for sharing that piece. Cause we, we sometimes see people at the mountaintop and don't understand that mm-hmm. was not, a, that was not an easy leap, right? No. There was some crawling, was there was some dragging <laughs> yes. um, and there were some moments of, of being stalled in our mm-hmm. own minds or in our own thoughts. So thank you so much for bringing light to that. Going back though, right? Because you've been in the space for a, a while and I can only yeah. imagine that this is not an easy space to be in, right? Just yeah. because it's it's people at their at their lowest, mm-hmm. um, people in their most vulnerable state. So tell yeah. us how you even even got to the space where you developed a career in social work and now domestic violence. As a child growing up from probably elementary school through high school, I was raised up in an abusive household. And so I saw that every day. I saw domestic violence in my face. Like, this is this is life. And I remember in middle school, I decided I wanted to become a lawyer because I wanted to put abusers in jail. I wanted to be a prosecutor. That was my that was my goal. But once I got to the place where I was going up to college, I went to I ended up going to Michigan State. And once I got to college, I started really just developing my relationship with God and just establishing that, getting more understanding of what my purpose is. What am I supposed to be doing here? What am I passionate about? And I was led to pursue a career in social work, which is amazing, (laughs) has been an amazing journey. But what I started off doing initially with this whole, with my career is I started volunteering at a place that I wanted to work at. I started volunteering there and eventually probably a year and a half later started working there as a residential counselor for domestic violence. And so I always tell people like when you're starting off your career, even if you're not getting paid, go and volunteer at that place where you want to be asked to offer to be an intern at that space, whatever it is to get you connected to going into that direction and doing that work. That's how you should, if, if there aren't any jobs available at the time go and pursue it anyway, as it relates to a volunteer place or internship. And so I went in that direction first. And as I was getting my degree, I went to the, I went to the University of Chicago and got a graduate, a master's degree in social work. And throughout that process, I had internships at mental health facilities, as well as domestic violence agencies. And I learned and grew at that time. Every time I had a volunteer opportunity or an internship, I always treated it as if I was getting paid full time. Like that's the biggest thing. Sometimes people forget like, oh, I'm just volunteering or I'm just interning. No, you're setting a name for yourself. You're setting the, you're almost pretty much building up your reputation within this community. And so when opportunities come, they can think about, oh, what about that volunteer we have? Or what about that intern? She did such a great job. I always treated every opportunity as if it were a paying job. And I believe that's what made the difference between me and potentially other candidates as it relates to just opportunities that came my way overall. Because I always treated 
every opportunity with the utmost respect. I got to work on time, got to that volunteer opportunity on time, did excellent work and just did as much as I possibly could to just represent myself well. When we moved down here to um, Georgia, because we originally were in Chicago, when we moved to Georgia, I pretty much had to start over again. My husband had found a job down here in Georgia and I was a stay-at-home mom for a good minute. Like I think for the next four years, I was a stay-at-home mom. And here I am thinking, oh my goodness, my career is over. (laughs) But it wasn't. It was not over. I networked. Some of the mom groups that I was a part of, they had executives who were also taking a temporary break from in order to just train up their kids temporarily for a little while. And even in those moments, I knew that wherever I go, I'm building a name for myself. I want people to know Katha Blackwell. That should be a name that has a positive ring to it, not a negative one. So every circle I was a part of, I represented myself, my family, and my faith in those circles. And then even in volunteer opportunities, I did the same thing. So I really, I I really encourage people to really embrace opportunities that come your way. Don't take them for granted because you never know who's in that circle that may be your next connection to that next step in your career. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you just you really just opened the door for me to talk about networking again, because I do absolutely believe in the power of, of networking, of building relationships, yeah. of being able to provide resources to others and then being able to tap into their resources. And, and so really that community building aspect of it. And so I love the fact that in your time, in your time away, if you will, from your, yeah. your corporate career, you still actively networked and you partnered with other mm-hmm. individuals. I think the the question that I, I wanted to ask, because I've, I've encountered some individuals who they've either been in the workforce like you, and then due to circum- circumstances have had to transition into being at home, especially now with the great resignation or mm-hmm. whatever they're calling it these days. We've seen a lot of women having to make the decision to leave the workforce to take care of family, whether that be their children or aging parents. And so I'm curious during that process, like I'm I'm pretty sure there was some emotional stuff that you had to work through as well. What advice would you give to some of the women who have had to make that decision and who have had to prioritize family who may be feeling like, oh my gosh, my career is over? What are some of the the things or some pieces of advice that you can give to them to encourage them that no, it's not over if as long as they don't want it to be? Absolutely. What I would say to anyone who is in that position of being home with those beautiful babies is that this is a season. This is a moment in time. This does not have to be your forever. That's one thing that I did and told myself is that this is a moment in time. And while I'm at home, I'm pouring into my children, especially if we're in agreement, if you're in agreement with your significant other, that this is what we want to do for our family at this point in time. Just know that it's just it's for a moment and that there's a way that the time can be redeemed. I always believe that God can redeem the time that you feel that you've lost. My story alone is a a miracle. But I, I would encourage them to know that this is a moment in time and that it's okay to do part-time things, even if it's just volunteering somewhere, or even if it's writing and dreaming. I remember I used to journal about how I wanted to see my career go after this season, after this moment of getting these children to a certain age. I used to journal and write. And even with my book, that's I, I produced that book while I was staying at home with my children. I was able to just write and do all kinds of things. So I would encourage them to know that this is a moment in time This is not going to completely end your career altogether. There are several women who are now in C-suite positions who took time off to take care of their family or took time off to reflect and think through what their next steps are going to be. And I, I wholeheartedly believe what God has for you is for you. I wholeheartedly believe that. And as long as we're walking and doing what we are wholeheartedly believing in, I believe that things work out for you. We'll, we'll work out for your good. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And and on the other side of that, right, when it was time for you to step back into the workforce, what were some of the initial things that you did? Obviously, you were already building your network, you were building the yeah. relationships, 
Uh, you are very active in the community, but what were some of the other things that you did, uh, tangible things that you could share if someone is possibly considering coming out or they're getting that clarity of what that next phase of life looks like for them? So one thing I, I would do is I go and connect with training opportunities that were available online or go and attend a class to just, just to sharpen my skills. The longer you stay home, sometimes the harder it is for our brains to like process back into what we know. So what I would do is I would go and attend trainings, go to different classes, whether, whether it be online or in person, but just to sharpen my skills, sharpen my abilities, and then also connect with someone who's doing the work that I am interested in doing and build up that relationship as well. That goes back to that networking piece, but that was crucial as well. And then positive self-talk is very imp impactful. So like there are times where people look down upon people who may stay home for or have a, like a large gap in their career. And they look at that resume and they see like, oh, there's a five year gap here. That's not necessarily a bad thing. That may have, there may have been a time where you were focusing in on your family or for whatever reason, didn't go back to work. But even, even going into those environments, people may not think that you are strong enough or qualified to do this work. Or maybe there's been such a gap, such a large gap that they think that you're not good enough. But I encourage people to just continue to have positive self-talk and just show them. Even, even when you're staying at home, you're managing your home, you're, you're managing your bills. <laughs> That's finance. <laughs> so there's a multitude of skill sets that you have in front of you, but people don't always label it that way. But even right now, this is social. This is networking and social media and different things of that sort. This is a that's a skill set. And so just being mindful of the skills and gifts that you do bring to the table that other people may not have is always is very beneficial as you go back into that work setting. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Just going to make a slight pivot here. And so here you are. You've taken time off. Right. You've poured into your family. You've come back into the workforce. You've climbed your way up and, and are now gone from peer to leader in, in a relatively, I'll say short amount of time, it probably didn't feel short for you. But as you think about it, right, because we know that even with, with newer leaders who are peers, when they get elevated to the next level, there's a lot that they have to kind of work through, right? There's a lot of positive self-talk. There's a lot of reinforcing things. So talk to us about your experience going from, and I know you were already in a leadership capacity um, prior to, yeah. to being elevated to CEO, but how has that transition been for you in your first 90 days? It's actually been a really good transition for me. And that one reason why I think it's been very uh, positive for me is because I always was a professional co-worker. I never really became friends or buddies per se. I want, I'm, I'll use the word buddies. Professional friendly, yes, but not friends or buddies in a sense. When it came to my peers, I wasn't I didn't connect with, with them on Facebook or you know any other social media platform outside of the professional LinkedIn profile. Other than that, I didn't connect with them in that sense. I wasn't going to birthday parties or any of those things outside of work. I kept a level of just professionalism as it relates. Not to say that that's an unprofessional approach, but for me, having those clear boundaries made it easier for me to get into this seat. If I had a bestie that was one of my peers, I could see how this could be a difficult transition from, oh, we were besties, now I'm your boss, so now I'm your supervisor. But because I already had a professional you know, business relationship with my peers, it was easy for me to step into this role because I'm still the same cat that I was at that point in time as well, where this is the direction we're going in. This is the vision I see. They were already familiar with how I do things. And so it's been a good transition. I'm so glad to hear that. And related to that, right? Because I, I, it sounds like the individual who was the CEO before recently retired. And so we know that sometime in organizations, when there's massive change like that, right? There's a lot of plowing, right? And, and laying yes. a new foundation. And so mm -hmm. what has that transition been like for you in, in terms of being able to maintain the integrity of the mission and the vision of the organization, but also putting your stamp and your, your vision and getting buy-in from your, your former peers 
and, yeah. and team members. Yeah. So with that whole, with the whole shift of change, change is big. Like it, the way you approach it can make or break your agency, really, I believe. And so for me, when I first started off that first all staff meeting that I wanted, I wanted to have a speaker come and focus on change. It was a motivational speaker that we invited in and he, he spoke to us for about 30 minutes about dealing with change, adapting to change because everyone deals with change differently. And so being mindful of that, I want us to go ahead, let's just rip this Band-Aid off because change is coming. But one thing I've learned and I know is beneficial to any team that's going through change is a, to have a gradual change, not all at once, but just a gradual ease into a change. Like there's a lot of things I, I would love to change immediately. <laughs> However, I know that this is not... Um, this is not a sprint. It's a long couple days, couple years marathon as it relates to the vision that I see our agency going towards, but it's in its baby steps because I can't move any faster than my team. That's one of the biggest key areas of leadership is I, I can push us all day and I can have vision, but if they're not moving, we're not moving. Right. If they're not moving, we're not moving. I can move all day, but if they're not with me, that where, where are we? <laughs> and I definitely can't do everything myself. So taking time to recognize that change is taking place and then casting vision, showing them the vision. What is, where are we going as an agency? Is my job secure? W- what will happen next? Are we still going to have this, these same activities taking place? And also hearing from them what they value most or what they enjoy about their job makes a world of difference because um, that helps me become mindful of what they hold dear and how does what they hold dear line up with the vision of where I see our agency going. And so I really took time to do that. Even now, even though it's just, it's been the first 90 days, I'm still, we've changed a couple things, but I'm still gradually changing other things, slowly but surely, making sure certain things are in place. But I want I want to make sure my team is on board and understands the vision of where we're going. Yeah, Yeah, I love that. And you you said so many powerful things there, especially with regards to if I'm moving and my team isn't moving, then we're not moving. Um, And that is that is such an important point to to call out, because oftentimes what leaders will do in in a new situation like that or sometimes do is that they feel like, okay, now I got to pull people along. So now they Uh are overburdened um, and burnt out (laughs) when, you know, (laughs) before they even started. And like you said, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So I love that you have that, that mindset as it is. And I was actually just connecting with someone yesterday where uh, we were discussing creating change in their organization. And I had to mention that studies show that 70% of change management initiatives fail because of lack of communication, lack of planning, lack of adoption and all of those things. So I I love the fact that you are being mindful in, in gradually rolling out change and also incorporating your team, right? Understanding how, how will the change impact them and Mm -hmm. how can you create a marriage between what it is that they want in terms of their growth with the change that you're envisioning. So thank you for sharing that bit of a a bit of wisdom with us, because I think that that needs to be reinforced. It it sounds like it it should be common sense, but (laughs) trust me, it is not. (laughs) No, it is not. No, it is not. That's true. And the one, one thing that was, has been really impactful for my team is actually I, every week I check in with them to see how they're doing. And my one of my biggest questions is, what do you need? What do you need? What is hindering you? And that was like my first week actually was one of my biggest conversations that I had with the entire executive team is, what do you need? What's hindering you from getting what you need? And where do you see your department going? Because I want to address those things that are blocking them from getting to that level of excellence where they want their department to go or where they want their team to go. I want to address that because if it's hindering you, then it's hindering us from moving forward. So I encourage leaders to have that mindset of I'm here to make sure that the hindrances that are blocking them from accomplishing that task are getting addressed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so with that, I mean, no pressure here because I know you're, you're in your first 90 days. 
What is the vision for the organization? Where, where do you see the organization growing? It's already the, the largest, right? In the, in Georgia or in Atlanta yeah. as it is. So wh- what do you, where do you see you leading this organization and the legacy that you plan to leave through it? With the vision of our agency, I see us figuring out a way to help survivors stay within their home safely. For decades, our nation and our world really has been teaching survivors how to run from a, how to run for their life. And it's like, it makes no sense for someone to commit a crime against you and now you have to leave your home. That's not fair. Out of every other crime in this world, why is it that survivors of domestic violence are pushed to leave their home? Why? Why aren't abusers pushed to leave and leave her alone? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that's one area. The other area is entrepreneurship and developing that peace amongst our clients. And then also developing more revenue streams. As a nonprofit, sometimes nonprofits don't think about starting their own fee-for-service business or an additional revenue stream for their agency. And so right now we have different ideas that are being developed in order for us to not solely depend on grants or fundraisers, but to focus in on how can we empower ourselves by designing something, whether it be trainings that we facilitate, whether it be helping um, corporate entities develop their policies and procedures around domestic violence, whether it's an after-school club that focuses on healthy friendships, we need to develop something of our own. And I know there's a lot of nonprofits out there who they may have a resale shop or there are businesses here in Georgia where they sell rugs and they hire clients to do that work, different things of that sort. We need to find something of our own as well to produce and that can benefit the community as well as add up to our mission. And then the other thing that is really intricate as it relates to our the vision that I have for our agency is our mission statement. Our mission statement right now is to end the crime of intimate partner violence and empower its survivors. But our agency is doing um, all types of domestic violence work and intimate partner violence is just one part. And so I really want us to focus in on changing our mission statement because it really doesn't reflect the totality of the work we're doing in the community. We're doing dating violence. We're doing intimate partner violence. We're doing family violence. So we're, I mean, we're, <laughs> we're doing all of it. And it's important that our mission statement lines up with where we are now as an agency 45 years later. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing that vision with us. And w- before I let you go, just a couple of real quick rapid fire questions here. My audience is probably tired of hearing me say this, but I believe that leaders are readers. So what book or books are repeatedly tapped into? John Maxwell's Five Levels of Leadership. That's one of my biggest, I love that book. (laughs) That's my favorite. And I actually have um, Radical Candor by Kim Scott. That's on my bookshelf as well. Those books are just a wealth of knowledge, wealth of information, and also Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. That's huge as well. So going, tapping into those books reminds me of my leadership capacity, where I am, especially with John Maxwell's books. He's always reminding us that you can't make somebody follow you. (laughs) That's not how that works. And so he, he goes deeply into that information. And so I always try to reach back and remember that when it comes to leadership, I can't make somebody follow me. They have to want to do that. And so building up those relationships, being your authentic self, like in Radical Candor, they stress authentic, you know, being authentic as whoever you are at home, you should bring that person to work. I try to do all of that and making sure that I am who I am at work. But I'm also authentic. I'm not putting on a face, but also being mindful that everyone's values don't necessarily line up with mine. And that when it comes to having people follow you as a leader, they have to want to follow you. And you do that by building relationships with them. Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a student of John Maxwell as well. Thank you for sharing, for sharing those book recommendations. We'll definitely include them in the show links below. As far as ways for people to connect with you, to touch base, to learn more about the agency and the organization and support this amazing mission uh, and vision that you have and that you're, you plan on carrying out for the next several years, how can the audience get in touch with you? 
visit our website at www.padv.org. Awesome. And on, on social, where do you hang out the most? I hang out on LinkedIn and on Facebook. Yeah. Okay. And awesome. it's Kappa Blackwell there as well. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So we'll include your, your LinkedIn. Um, so definitely if you want to connect with her, are there any major uh, projects or major initiatives that are on the come up that you're possibly looking for volunteers or individuals to, to connect with in the community? Oh, absolutely. We just recently started welcoming volunteers back into our shelters to do work with clients. And so we are open for people to provide meals to clients if they want to come and cook a meal on site or if they want to prepare it at home and then bring it to clients on site. We welcome that. I don't know anyone who doesn't love coming home to a home cooked meal and our clients love that. So uh, if you have any volunteers who love to cook, this is the place for you. If you enjoy reading story time or baking cookies for kids. This is a place for you. Awesome. And Katha, thank you so much uh, for coming on today, for sharing your journey, for sharing your experience, the nuggets of wisdom around leadership and leading your team and your own personal transitions. All of Katha's information will be in the show notes below. Please be sure to connect with her. Let her know that you heard her on the She Leads Now podcast. And with that, I will see you all next week. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of She Leads Now. Be sure to join us next week for another transformative discussion to help you grow, develop, and embody the courageous leader you've always been. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get alerts when new episodes drop and join us for our next Leaders Lounge meetup on Zoom. Details and dates for future sessions are included in the show notes below. So take a look there or head over to sabinegideon.com forward slash lounge to register and hold your spot for the next session. Again, that's sabinegideon.com forward slash lounge to grab your spot. Excited to connect with you all inside the lounge. Talk to you soon.